Hi everybody, this is Dr. Ryan Yalloway and this is my second part of my lecture on courts and we're going to talk about if you are negative against a case using the Supreme Court, some things that you can do. So the first negative argument is the court legitimacy disad. And I foreshadowed this a little bit in the affirmative lecture, but the Supreme Court has no tangible ability to enforce its decisions. It doesn't have the military, it doesn't have the police, it doesn't have any money. So the question is, how do court decisions get enforced? And the answer is, the court relies 100% on its legitimacy. In other words, its persuasive power to convince other branches to go along with it. And if the court doesn't have legitimacy, it can't enforce its decisions. So a really good example of this is Brown versus Board of Education. In Brown versus Board of Education, the Supreme Court struck down segregation in schools. But a lot of governors and a lot of states didn't listen to the Supreme Court and they didn't integrate their schools. It was so bad that Dwight Eisenhower, who was the president of the United States, had to send the National Guard down to the South to make sure that the ability of black children to attend school was enforced. Now, if Eisenhower had decided not to do that, there would have been no enforcement for the decision. And the Supreme Court only had its persuasive ability. It only had the reasoning for its decision and the history of the fact that other people listen to the court to rely upon. The argument is that controversial decisions will sap the court's legitimacy. And what's interesting about this is that in 1972, the Supreme Court struck down the death penalty in the case of Furman v. Georgia. But that created a big backlash in society against the court. And within four years, the various states and the federal government had come back to the court with new death penalty statutes and the court upheld those statutes. So we don't know for sure whether or not the reason the court did that was because it was fearing for its legitimacy. But I think you can make the case that the Supreme Court responded to the backlash, responded to the idea, hey, we're out of touch with American society and rolled back its own decision. One impact you could run is presidential powers. The court needs to stand up to the president. And the court has made decisions against the president of the United States before. And the question is whether or not the president or other powers will be willing to uphold that decision. So Trump has been forced to listen to the Supreme Court before. And the question is whether or not he would again if the court wasn't legitimate. The court has made decisions like Hamden v. Rumsfeld against the Bush administration. And the question is whether or not they'll enforce it. There was a line in the census that asked for people's citizenship. And the Supreme Court struck that down and said you can't have a census that asks for people's citizenship. And for a while it looked like Trump was going to say, hey, I'm not going to listen to you. I'm going to put that in the census anyway. But then he backed down and the census didn't have the citizenship question. And again, it's a little tricky to determine why someone makes the decision that they make. But Trump did go along with the Supreme Court and did not include the citizenship question on the census. The most popular disadvantage that people run is court capital. You might hear it called court politics, but it's a variant of the legitimacy disad. So some people theorize that the court has a certain amount of institutional capital, and it will also be called political capital of the court that it can use. John Roberts, the current head of the Supreme Court, the current chief justice of the Supreme Court, believes in this theory, believes in the idea that the court only has a certain amount of political capital, and he tries to conserve that political capital for controversial 
cases. As a specific example, when Obamacare was before the court in National Federation of Independent Businesses versus Sebelius, Roberts decided with the liberal majority on a 5-4 decision that Obamacare was constitutional. And a lot of people think he did this because he didn't want the court striking down the major legislative accomplishment of the President of the United States. So the court doesn't want to look bad, so they will only make a certain number of controversial decisions. And so if the plan comes in and makes a controversial decision, the Supreme Court will be less willing to make other controversial decisions. And the way you do this is you run a specific upcoming court case as a disadvantage. So you'd look at the docket in the upcoming term and you would research that one of these decisions is going to be really controversial and that the Supreme Court needs its institutional or political capital in order to make that decision. And if they get their capital sapped by the plan, they won't make the controversial decision. They'll go the other way in the case. And like I say, this is probably the most popular modern courts disad. This and the Constitutional Amendment counterplan are the bread and butter of a lot of teams against cases that go through the Supreme Court. Court clog is the idea that the plan will cause a flood of new cases. So if a case was to come down, striking down the death penalty, people might try and figure out, well, what other punishments are cruel and unusual? The Supreme Court has just declared that the death penalty is cruel and unusual punishment. Will they declare that solitary confinement is cruel and unusual punishment? Will they declare that certain other methods of incarceration or certain other alternatives to incarceration are unconstitutional? How about the Eighth Amendment? What are other areas that it could apply to? Maybe they've decided on the right to life. And if you decide the case on the right to life, people might decide, hey, you decided there was a right to life for innocent people, so maybe there should be a right to life for the unborn. But the point is, is that people will look at the new precedent and say, aha, maybe this court is going to decide my way on something, so let's send a bunch of cases up to the Supreme Court. And that overloads the system. There are too many cases. There are too many cases that now state and federal judges have to decide upon, and they can't process all of the cases. Some people say that undermines the economy because businesses need access to the courts, and if the court gets overloaded, the economy will suffer. Some people say it hurts solutions to terrorism because we need to be aggressively prosecuting terrorist suspects, and if the court gets too clogged, it can't do that effectively. The problem you're going to have with this disadvantage is winning that it's unique. The courts are pretty overloaded right now. The federal government doesn't give a lot of resources to the federal courts in order for them to handle all of these new cases. And as a result of that, it's difficult to win uniqueness for it. But you can run it as a small this ad on the case. You can run it as an answer to permutations. It's a good thing to have in the arsenal just in case you need it. Hollow Hope, and this is the court's disad that is in your packet. It is named after Gerald Rosenberg's book, The Hollow Hope, Can the Courts Produce Social Change? And Rosenberg's answer is no, that the courts are bad for social change. And the argument goes that courts are flypaper for social movements, that a big symbolic case will suck a movement in. So right now, the criminal justice reform movement in the United States is focusing on a lot of different things. They're trying to eliminate the death penalty. They're trying to eliminate mass incarceration of prisoners. They're trying to decrease penalties on a lot of drug offenses, etc. And research indicates that they're not going to the Supreme Court right now, that they're going to the legislative branch like Congress, who passed the First Step Act, and they're going to a lot of state legislatures in order to get them 
to pass criminal justice reform legislation. However, if the Supreme Court struck a big blow for the criminal justice reform movement, the movement would say, hey, we need to focus our energy, our time, our resources on going to the Supreme Court. The problem is that the court cannot produce good social change. Rosenberg makes a lot of different reasons for this, but it's institutionally constrained. It can only focus on rights. It has to follow precedent. It can only interpret laws and it cannot make laws. The judiciary is pretty conservative as it is. So even if the plan fiated one beneficial action, it wouldn't necessarily mean that in other cases, the Supreme Court run by the conservatives and the federal district courts run by the conservatives, since Trump has appointed a lot of conservative judges, will all of a sudden be open to change. So the movement gets stuck in the courts, the movement gets hurt, and you can claim advantages to the criminal justice movement. You could say the criminal justice movement helps the economy because we need a lot of people out of jail instead of enforcing drug penalties against them. You can run that the criminal justice reform movement is key to democracy. You could also claim that other progressive movements would say to themselves, hey, the criminal justice reform movement won, maybe we can win too. I think it's a little bit of a stretch, but the climate justice reform movement has also been working around the courts. And the question then is, could the climate justice reform movement get trapped in the courts and lose its ability to create social change? There may be other movements that would be drawn to the court by the plan, but that's the fundamental thesis of this disadvantage, is the courts can't produce social change and a big symbolic victory for the court would cause people to run to the court with other kinds of decisions and then they would run flat into a wall because the Supreme Court is not effective at producing social change. Court stripping is when Congress limits the ability of the court to hear certain cases. And if Congress gets angry with the court, stripping occurs. So Congress can determine what kinds of cases the federal district courts and the Supreme Court can hear, and they can limit the jurisdiction of those courts to say, hey, you're not allowed to hear cases of this type. It undermines the court's ability to function and causes problems internationally if it looks like if the Congress gets upset with the courts that they will just limit the courts. It can undermine checks and balances. It can throw the whole system out of whack. <clears throat> Reverse politics. Now this is a little bit complicated, so I want to explain this. It works with the Congress counterplan. So what someone would do is they would have Congress do the plan. They might have Congress strike down the death penalty. And then they run a politics dis-ed where triggering the impact is good. So they claim Trump is bad. So they say Congress bans the death penalty. After banning the death penalty, that will soak up so much political capital that, say, the drug pricing bill wouldn't pass and the drug pricing bill is bad. You then argue that the permutation and the plan alone shield the link, preventing the good impact from happening. So then you say the trick that affirmatives use to avoid the politics disad you say the permutation to the counterplan would shield the Congress, and if they're shielded, they wouldn't lose their political capital, and it's good for them to lose their political capital. So on this slide, I gave you an example of reverse politics. So the scenario you could run is drug pricing. There is some evidence that says one of the few things that the Democrats and Republicans in Congress can agree upon is a measure to limit the price of drugs. The Congress counter plan would undermine the drug pricing bill. So you would say fiatting through Congress 
would hurt Trump's political capital and tank the drug pricing bill, and then the drug pricing bill is bad. Now, the obvious thing the affirmative would do is they would claim that the permutation, having both Congress and the courts do the plan, the permutation would tank Trump's political capital and prevent the drug pricing bill from happening. But the world of the permutation has to include the court action, and the court action shields the Congress from scrutiny. It prevents a loss to its political capital. And as a result of that, the permutation is incapable of hurting Congress's political capital, and hurting Congress's political capital is good because the drug pricing bill is bad. It's a little bit confusing, but it's a very effective strategy, and it's very powerful, so you need to be aware of it. And if you're affirmative against that, you want to say that the courts don't shield the other branches political capital, and the courts can make controversial rulings that affect other people's decision-making processes and hurts their political capital. And this disadvantage counterplan strategy was run in the 2010 finals of the NDT, which Michigan State was in. So if you have questions about that, you might want to ask some people from MSU about how that goes down. The Constitutional Amendment Counterplan. It amends the Constitution to take the same action as the plan. So this is a very common strategy against Supreme Court affirmatives. It saw its heyday during the court's topic in 2006-2007 in college debate, and a lot of people won debates by amending the Constitution and then running the court politics disad or the court capital disad. It argues to capture the signal of the court decision. So what is going to send a more powerful signal internationally? Is it going to be a singular Supreme Court decision, or is it going to be an entire amendment to the Constitution? And the answer is an entire amendment to the Constitution probably would send a bigger signal than the courts would. We only have a few constitutional amendments. I think we have 28 constitutional amendments right now in the entirety of the Constitution. So the counterplan would send a very powerful signal to capture the court decision. And the net benefit to this counterplan is court capital. Arguably, a constitutional amendment hurts the court's institutional capital less than an overruled decision by the Supreme Court. If the Supreme Court reverses itself, it makes it look bad, and if they reverse themselves, they lose their institutional capital to decide that way in other cases. This is a little bit tricky because there are also arguments that the counterplan links to its own net benefit because if you have a constitutional amendment to overrule the courts, it makes the courts look pretty silly because the entire, both houses of the Congress and two thirds of the states said, hey, you're so out of touch that we have to overrule you with a constitutional amendment. There are also critiques specific to the court, and probably the number one critique is the critical legal studies critique. Critical legal studies says the law is inherently biased, that the law was created by rich white men, and it protects the interests of rich white men, and it doesn't matter what the law says, judges will just manipulate the law to bolster the rich. So there are just an enormous number of precedents that are out there for the Supreme Court to apply. And the argument that the CLS authors make is that the law is indeterminate, which means you can pretty much do whatever you want with the law. You could find a precedent somewhere to support your interpretation of whatever you wanted to do. And they argue that judges work backwards. They say, this is the result I want to achieve. Now I'm just going to interpret the law 
to achieve the result that I wanted to achieve in the first place. And I'll give you an example from my own life. We moved into an apartment complex, my wife and I, when we first moved to Alabama. And there were a bunch of problems with the apartment. They hadn't fixed a bunch of things. Our water wasn't working right in some places. And we made a list of about 10 or 11 things that we sent over to them. And they didn't respond to our list without a week, week and a half went by and they hadn't responded. And I said, okay, give me our lease. I'm going to find something that they violated in our lease. And one of the things we were complaining about is it looked like some wet fuzz was coming from our air conditioner. And I read the lease and we had a mold amendment to the lease. And I said, we should say that looks like mold. You have 48 hours to come over here and fix it. So then we sent a new letter and I signed it Dr. Ryan Yalloway and I tried to look all official and say, you have 48 hours to come and fix this mold and while you're here, you can fix the other things too. And lo and behold, they came because we had triggered the mold amendment to the lease and they came and they fixed all the things in our apartment. Now, I wasn't actually concerned that the air conditioner was leaking mold. I was looking for anything that could trigger our lease and get them to come over and fix the other things. So I started with the result I wanted I want you to come over here and fix this. And I found something that they violated. Similarly, what the CLS authors argue that judges do is they say, I want to decide this way. Now I'm going to find any possible way in which I could decide that way. The CLS authors would say it's bad to uphold the law and make it look good. You shouldn't mask the law. You should instead rely upon grassroots movements in order to solve problems. Now, people run a legalism critique, which is very similar to this, where they say the law shouldn't be used and you should use grassroots movements instead. I think the difference is form and not substance, but debaters being debaters, they'll say, oh, you answered the CLS critique, not our legalism critique, which is totally different, when in fact the two are very similar, but I wanted to make you aware of that, both for the negative and for the affirmative, that there are critiques you can run specific to litigation. In conclusion, I've talked to you about disadvantages to Supreme Court action. They are different than disadvantages to congressional action. If you are debating a Supreme Court case, you need to be familiar with those kinds of disadvantages so you can argue against them. And if you're affirmative, obviously you want to be prepared to answer those disadvantages. You can run a couple of different types of counter plans and their net benefits. We talked about the Congress counter plan. We talked about the constitutional amendment counter plan. Whichever one suits your fancy, you can run against court cases. Obviously you can run the state court's counter plan too, which is a lot like the state's counter plan, just using the state Supreme Courts instead of state legislatures. And I've talked about at least one specific critique to the Supreme Court. So hopefully this will get you ready to debate court cases and you can learn a lot about new areas of the law and how the court functions in society when you get to researching and when you get into these cases.